are in chapter 7 today on warfare, and uh, it, it's a topic of uh, some interest today. Uh, on the one hand, you have the uh, members of the uh, mainline Protestant churches who have this idea that God is love, and then therefore any notion of God as being a God of war, uh, a God who fights and puts people to death uh, is something that is anathema to them. Um, in our last sermon from Exodus 15, we talked about the fact that God is a warrior. Now we didn't explain that much. We didn't explain that much uh, because I have a sermon that I preached about three years ago in the same text. <laughs> so I um, had a different take on the sermon this week, this past Sunday. Uh, to focus on other interests from the text. But God is a warrior. Uh, he takes the enemies of his kingdom, his church, and destroys them. And uh, that battle that took place at the Red Sea is in anticipation of the great casting of Satan and his host into the uh, lake of fire at the end of history and time. So we're coming up. We're doing good. So... Um, the Lord is a warrior, and uh, we also enter into that warfare together. Um, so let me begin reading from Dr. Welch, and we'll make comments. And again, just a reminder, if you have a question, feel free to ask uh, if there's something that uh, you don't understand, would like to explain a little bit more fully or something like that. Just you know, as we go along the way, feel free to chime in on that. Um, and we'll try to stay focused on uh, what we have here on the topic of spiritual warfare. So, Welch writes, Carol would say that it was impossible to fight against depression, but she already was fighting. She had sought help from professionals and peers. She read. She kept putting one foot in front of the other. She tried to steer clear of the especially dark thoughts that threatened to overtake her. So she really had engaged in the battle. It was settled. Her next step was to fight smart. Now when I read that opening paragraph, uh, I thought there was a bit of an inner contradiction there. Carol said it was impossible to fight against depression, and yet she was fighting. And I thought, well, Carol was well, well aware of the fact. But I think what Dr. Welch is trying to say was that Carol felt that there was nothing that she could do about her depression but in spite of that, she actually was doing a lot to try to fight it. She just didn't realize it and, and appreciate the fact that she was engaged in spiritual warfare against that depression. She just, you know, depression so works at you that you feel like there's nothing worthwhile, nothing you can do, and everything's worthless and all that kind of thing. So um, you just uh, uh, continue on as is. So um, Dr. Welch makes the point that in spite of counselees sometimes thinking that there's nothing you can do about it, they actually belie that by their own activities, <laughs> sometimes by being in the office with the counselor. That very fact that they're sitting there trying to gain counsel and advice regarding depression is evidence that they're interested in fighting against this depression and overcoming it. So there is a war and we are engaged in it uh, one way or the other, whether you realize it or not. Um, you could take that more broadly to say that in our spiritual life, you are spiritually involved in a warf warfare every day, whether you appreciate that fact or not. It is inevitable if you are in Christ's church, we are a part of the church militant, which means in this life, at this time, we are engaged in spiritual warfare. And it has many components, uh, various complexities to it. We'll get into some of that uh, this morning, Lord willing. But um, we are engaged in warfare. It's spiritual warfare. Maybe sometimes we'll even break out into actual physical conflict. But uh, we need to be alert to the fact that there is this tremendous conflict of the ages going on. It's the spirit of Christ versus the spirit of Antichrist. It's the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness, of Satan, the kingdom of light against the kingdom of darkness. Yeah, these great forces at work in history and time, and the church is caught up in that as part of the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's dear Son. 
And so we are the army of the Lord in the world, and we are engaged in mortal conflict with Satan and his hosts. So uh, be aware of the fact that there is a conflict, that there is a warfare. Um, we could spend some time in talking about the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal uh, ideas about spiritual warfare, which they are very much interested in, but they are very imaginative in seeing demons here and there and uh, binding Satan this and that and that sort of thing. So uh, I think they go well beyond what Scripture gives us. But uh, we are in a warfare and we need to be aware of that. So Welsh continues, If you knew an enemy was in hot pursuit, you would be on guard, especially if that enemy specialized in guerrilla tactics. Even when depressed, a threat on our lives is enough to ensure a surge of energy. Unless, of course, we didn't know an enemy was after us. So it's kind of like uh, what Jesus said about the thief coming to your house. If you know what time he's coming, you'll be on the alert. You'll protect yourself against him. Uh, by the same token, if you know that you are in the spiritual conflict, um, you will then think aggressively about how to defend yourself. Uh, these kinds of things have been brought to my attention uh, more focally over the last few months as I've been uh, following a security advisor who has a background in the CIA and other things and uh, advising people about how to defend themselves in, in the event of some sort of personal conflict or to defend their homes uh, or what to do in terms of uh, a, a, a major catastrophe and whether you need to bug out and move off someplace else. Um, there are all kinds of things to think about and um, so there are a variety of ways in which we can understand this idea of warfare. Um, so continuing, during times of suffering and difficulty, spiritual warfare is virtually guaranteed. We watch Satan seize what he thought was his golden opportunity when Jesus was led into the desert to endure physical suffering and spiritual isolation. That's in Matthew 4. You can also see that, I believe, in both Mark and Luke as well. How much more will Satan pursue mere mortals when they go through the emotionally arid experience of depression? The Bible depicts him as a lion lurking in the tall grass, patiently waiting to devour those who are susceptible. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. So, we have Jesus as our example, and we note that uh, it was at a time of particular stress that the devil came to him. And that's very much the way that Satan works in our hearts and minds. When we are physically exhausted, when we are emotionally exhausted, it is at those times that we are especially vulnerable to attack. And so at that time that Jesus was in the uh, wilderness after 40 days of fasting, uh, and then Scripture says he became hungry. <laughs> I become hungry if I miss breakfast. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he endured that for 40 days. So... Um, be aware that Satan is a lion lurking in the tall grass, ready to strike. Um, if you have an iPhone or something like that and you go on Facebook or Instagram or other sites, you can see uh, National Geographic scenes of lions out in the wild and attacking an antelope or something like that or fighting this and that. And be mindful that Satan has that same kind of purpose for you. Oh, man. Right. Uh, so he continues, think about the nature of depression. Life is turned inward. You already have a sense that for all practical purposes, God is not present. Add to that your relentless condemnation and pervasive self-criticism, which have persuaded you that God doesn't love you. You couldn't be a more obvious spiritual target if you painted a bullseye on oh, your chest. No. So it, 
depression makes us especially vulnerable to temptation uh, of particular sorts. Uh, and we're going to go into some of the uh, unique ways in which uh, we are vulnerable to temptation. And we'll see that here as he continues. So uh, be aware of uh, the way that Satan uh, is at work. So that's what we're going to consider next, Satan's strategies. I think the Apostle Paul said that we're not unaware, yeah, I was going to quote it here, of his schemes and tactics. Um, Satan does uh, follow a certain pattern, if you will, in the way that he attacks us. He takes advantage of weaknesses and uh, he, he makes use of lies and murders as well. Uh, he is a destructive enemy. Um, there was an old book by the Puritans called Satan or, or Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And it talked about all the different ways in which temptation might come your way. And then from Scripture, the way the remedy for that particular approach. So it's kind of like going through a catalog of different possible attacks and developing responses to them. And uh, that can be a very helpful thing to give thought to. So Welch says, Satan masquerades as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, which means that he is not easily noticed. But the Apostle Paul assures us that God has revealed enough to make us aware of his schemes and tactics, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. To identify them, we should be thinking about the common and ordinary more than the bizarre, Overt demon possession, with its frightening manifestations, is one of Satan's tactics, but it also doubles as a ploy to have us think that his strategies are always accompanied by signs that draw attention to him. The truth is that, for his day-to-day -day business, he prefers not to alarm. He works more subtly in the following ways. So Satan is an angel of light, or pretends to be that. And so he comes to us as wanting to be your friend, uh, here to help. It's kind of like Ronald Reagan talking about the government. Uh, you know, lock your door when the government says, I'm here to help. Because <laughs> there's always something behind that. And uh, so uh, Satan uh, gives the appearance of wanting to be of help to you, to, to make life easier for you, to comfort you, to give you real joy, real satisfaction, all these kinds of things. But in fact, he's bringing a destructive uh, element into your life. And when we talk about Satan's work, um, a lot of times we do think in terms of demon possession. And there's a good question about the, the presence or prevalence of this sort of thing in these days. Uh, when Christ suffered on the cross, he disarmed the rulers, powers, and authorities, Colossians chapter 2. So there's a great conflict there at the cross with spiritual forces of darkness. We also learn from Revelation 20 that uh, Satan has been bound. Uh, Jesus used the parable of uh, uh, binding the strong man before he can plunder his house. And that was a, a parable or a picture of what Christ does through his death and resurrection, he has bound the strong man, Satan. The dominion that he had over the nations of the earth uh, at, at that time was broken. And now Christ and his disciples would go throughout the world making disciples, uh, baptizing them and teaching them to obey God. So uh, Satan has been bound. There's been a restriction on his activities, and especially in Christian cultures where there's been a prevalence of the Christian faith within that culture, these kinds of things are pushed to the side and uh, um, are largely out of view. Uh, I d do remember hearing uh, a pastor, I think he was an Orthodox Presbyterian pastor at the time out in uh, uh, California, in Escondido, California, the church there. It's now a PCA church, but in any case, um, he was talking about being in the presence of someone, of someone who was demon-possessed and the, kind of the weird phenomena that took place uh, in the room at that time. He was in California. <laughs> so all kinds of things happen out there. <laughs> Don't be surprised. <laughs> uh, 
there, there's a lot of spiritual darkness there in California, and so uh, he may have come across that kind of thing. Um, there's also a psychologist uh, who talked about demon possession and his conflict with the demonic realm in uh, counseling with people. I'm forgetting at the moment the, the writer's name. I don't think he was specifically a Christian. In any case, um, Dr. Welsh's point is that let's not get too wrapped up in that kind of stuff, which is rather extraordinary and rare because Satan does not want to call attention to himself and focus on those things which we deal with day to day in our personal experience everywhere we go. So this is where the real spiritual warfare takes place. So avoid a fascination with the spectacular, which is rare and hard, hardly ever seen, and, and focus on that which we have to deal with in reality. So the first thing that we consider is the fact of lies. And Welch writes, is there anything more common and ordinary than lies? They certainly don't capture our attention anymore because they come so naturally to us. Young children lie without being taught. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? You have a child grow up and right from the very start they're saying no to begin with and then they're lying about what what they've done. Did you eat that cookie from the cookie jar? No. <laughs> and they got cookie crumbs all over the mouth. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it, you see right from the earliest, earliest ages the evidence of our fallen nature uh, and the propensity of people to lie. Politicians lie and we expect it. <laughs> um, so uh, there, obviously there are plenty of lies being told in our politics today. You might also say the news media, the academic world, uh, uh, business no. world, all kinds of <laughs> lies. No. That's an no. interesting no. comment about the Clintons and the way that they oh obfuscate okay. things and, and redirect and, and you know so and, yeah. and that's kind of what Satan does he, he, he doesn't directly counter the truth or at least not at first he yeah. uses weasel language and leads you astray and it's only at the last moment when you're hooked when he brings in the full measure of his attack um, but anyway yeah. Welsh continues the variations are, are endless White lies, whoppers, self-justifications, exaggerations, minimizing, changing the subject. Uh, boy, that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Behind these deceptions is something more than an attempt to duck personal responsibility for wrongdoing. Behind them is the father of lies, Satan himself. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Uh, it would be interesting and worthwhile for us to go through that eighth chapter of John where Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees and other uh, teachers of the Jews and he argues that they are children of the devil. Uh, uh, the, their father is the devil and he was a liar from the beginning and so they, they pick up on his lies and so um, you know, we think we're telling truth and defending truth and that sort of thing, but Satan has so deluded us that we are telling falsehoods uh, and not even being aware of it. And that's why the Pharisees were attacking Jesus. They just didn't see the truth that Jesus was saying. They were completely blind to it, oblivious to it, unaffected by it, and hostile to it as well. And so, so he says, you too are vulnerable. You might be loyal to beliefs that are wrong, but highly resistant to change. For example, since you feel like you are a burden to your family, and you feel like they would be better off without you, you believe that is the truth. All their protests and expressions of love will not persuade you to change your mind. If you feel that God has abandoned you, then you believe that he actually has. Nothing will persuade you otherwise. In other words, feelings can lie. Here's the danger of living your life based on how you feel at any particular moment of the day. Your feelings can go all over the place 
the up and down and all the rest of it. And if you govern your life by those feelings, then you're going to be all over the place. You're going to be a mess. Um, that's why Jesus tells us to build our life on the sure foundation of his word. You see that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, that provides us stability, strength, security, so that we're not, uh, as Paul says, tossed about here and there by every wind of doctrine and so forth. We are secure in Christ. Um, so don't build your life based on your feelings. They can be deceitful. Um, I have personal experience of this. I hope that this doesn't get too far astray, but I had a girlfriend some many years ago now who uh, I would tell her that I loved her, and no matter what I said, she just couldn't accept it, and uh, yeah. she had she was kind of of a depressive nature, and so the, eventually she uh, broke up the relationship because she didn't believe that I loved her. No matter what I would say or do, that was that. So. Uh, sometimes you know, there's nothing you can do to persuade somebody of certain things. Um, their minds are set. And uh, uh, so that, to, to say that is just a check to make sure that you're not locked into something um, that, that uh, is false. So Welch writes, do you see the progression? You are spiritually vulnerable. Your emotions are so powerful that they skew your interpretations. Satan attacks. You swear allegiance to your most pessimistic interpretation no matter what others say. So in this spiritually vulnerable state, you're, that's when Satan takes advantage of you and uh, inflates your opinions of yourself and what you believe. There are no incantations, spinning heads, strange voices, or obvious satanic rituals involved here. It all seems very natural, but this is knock down, drag out spiritual warfare. And notice this is the language that we are speaking to ourselves, in your mind, in your heart. You're saying to yourself, essentially, I'm nothing, nobody cares for me, nobody loves me, and all this sort of thing. You don't have an external voice of somebody saying that to you. It's just what's going on within. And Satan's activity takes place within the heart, within the soul, and that's where it happens. We'll do that a little bit later, okay? Okay. Okay, we'll do that later. All right. We always go up now. Okay. So, uh, first, uh, we're going to consider lies about us. Satan's lies are calculated and strategic. They are directed at the spiritual jugular, the most important, okay, the most important issues of life. And I highlighted here, he goes through several paragraphs where he talks about what you believe, and then questioning that. You believe certain things, and are these things actually true? Um, so, do you live the unexamined life, as someone once said long ago? Do you believe that some things you have done are too bad to be forgiven? If so, you are believing Satan's lie that the blood of Jesus can only handle little or unintentional sins. The truth is that, through the cross, the judgment for sin has, taken, has been taken by Christ for those who believe including yourself, if you have claimed faith in Christ. Wrong. Do you believe that it is impossible for the Holy God to love you and even delight in you? If so, you are believing Satan's lie that God loves you because of what you do. The truth is that he loves you because he is the God who loves. And the sacrifice of Jesus proves it. The cross of Christ expresses God's delight in all who believe. And if you believe that Jesus is the risen Lord, he delights in and loves you. Uh, Paul makes that very plain in Romans chapter 5 where he talks about how God loved us while we were yet sinners. When we were hostile to him, he loved us, sent his son to die for us. And so therefore, if we are redeemed, will he not love us all the more as we are united to him. So to question God's love is really to misunderstand the nature of that love. It's not founded in who you are. It's founded 
in who God is and His purpose of expressing that to us. So we continue. Do you believe that you have no reason to live? If so, you are believing Satan's lie that you belong only to yourself. The truth is that you belong to God, and you have a God-given purpose. Furthermore, the cross of Christ reveals that God's purposes for your life are good. So, you have no reason to live? Well, you certainly do. Uh, if you're a Presbyterian, you understand the answer to the shorter catechism is that in the first question, uh, the, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. There is a purpose to life. It's to worship God, to serve Him. And it begins Amen. there. Amen. So, uh, when you get to that point where you're thinking worthless and there's nothing to life, think about the fact that God's purpose for you is that you should worship Him. And... Wow, if you got a hold of that, that would transform your feelings of depression because you're occupied with the glory of God and the wonder of who He is, and you're praising Him. You're, you're, the well, focus of your heart and mind is on Him and not upon yourself and on your own problems and these kinds of things. So, uh, that very so much, we're going through all these different uh, things that Satan persuades you to think about yourself, and they're all... Um, lies to you. Um, the, the fourth one here is, do you believe that these questions are unimportant? If so, you are believing Satan's lie that our relationship with God is unrelated to our struggle with depression. The truth is that your relationship with God is absolutely necessary, especially now. Your life depends on it. So, there's the temptation to disassociate our, our present experiences with God himself and think that God really doesn't have much of anything to do with it at all. And so why bother even talking about God? That's just for people who need a crutch, right? People who need the opiate, opiate of the masses. Um, so when you have that kind of mindset, then you really are in a frightful mess because uh, you don't have the one remedy that uh, would actually do something for you, um, a right relationship with God and the transforming power of the Spirit in your life. So it continues, waver on these questions and you will be experiencing the battle and losing <laughs> that battle. Don't think that these lies are automatically downloaded into our minds where we robotically replay them. Lies don't just impose themselves on our hearts. Instead, Satan's lies come to us after the seeds already exist. He is the counselor who endorses the lies we already suspect are true. He is the false witness who is quick to confirm our false interpretation. This is why spiritual warfare seems so natural. We are not be being taken against our wills. Rather than fight us where we have strong faith and certainty, and, lie, and lies will seem silly and obvious. Satan looks for faith that is weak in the hopes that we will meekly surrender. It begins when we harbor doubts. Satan, ever the opportunist, me, sees vulnerability and simply says, Yes, what you believe is true. Um, so, um, Satan takes advantage of advantage of our vulnerabilities. Uh, so we considered lies about ourselves and now we're going to look at lies about God. Excuse me, I think we just considered lies and I think he'll have another section on lies. Now let's, let's stay here. So he writes, if you look carefully at the lies you believe, you will notice that you are caught in a crossfire. Yes, you are an intended casualty, and the lies are self-condemning, but you are not the primary target of those lies. Instead, the volleys are aimed especially at the character of God. Their goal is to raise questions about God. Specifically, they question God's love and power. So here we find... Uh, 
there is a spiritual warfare at work, and it goes above and beyond us. It's between Satan and God himself. So notice, for example, Satan's initial lies. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden, and then you will not surely die? These words directly attack the goodness and truthfulness of God, which are both expressions of love. Satan is saying, can God's words really be trusted? Is God really good? Perhaps he is just holding out on you. Perhaps he is stingy. With these questions and accusations, he has all the firepower he needs. Most spiritual warfare consists of minor variations on these age-old assaults. Um, this is very much true uh, in our own hearts and minds and as we deal with others. The attack ultimately is a, an attack against the character of God, his, his goodness and love. And so when people are upset and angry with God, as we're going to see in our next sermon in ex at the end of Exodus 15, where the people wander out into the wilderness and there's no water there, and now they're upset, um, you have, it's as though Satan is working in the background saying, well, God really isn't good, or God really can't provide for you. And so therefore, the, the ultimate focus of everything is on God. So if you suspect that you are vulnerable to Satan's lies, and if you are depressed, just assume you are, rephrase those lies and see that they are more about God than they are about you. For example, I am worthless could be reinterpreted as God has not given me the success I desired, therefore I don't believe that he is good. I have lost the most important thing in life could be reinterpreted as God is not enough. I can't go on becomes I don't believe that God hears or is powerful enough to work through human weakness. Can you see it? Our suffering may come from many different places, but regardless of its origin, Satan ultimately is a player. Suffering is the ideal time for him to raise questions about God because we ourselves are already asking them. Suffering raises spiritual questions that cannot be ignored. The Apostle underscores this when he, re he reminds us that during suffering, Demonic warfare sets itself up against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. So you see the, these very personal ways of thinking about ourselves ultimately reflect on our theology and our understanding of God. And one of the things that we have to discipline ourselves is, uh, is to look through the present suffering and the way we're talking about ourselves to what this is saying about our relationship to God and who He is. And so ultimately behind these things, I'm worthless, uh, um, meaningless, life is meaningless, all these kinds of things, really is a conversation about God and who He is and what He is able to do or not able to do for us. And um, so when we begin to dig deeper and, and undermine the, the surface tension that Satan presents to us, uh, we see that this is really an attack against God and His character. Anyway, so we're focusing on lies that focus on temporal, not spiritual realities. This popular deception is underway even before suffering begins. During the better times, Satan happily encourages us to see the goodness of God all around us. You have a strong marriage. Isn't God good? This is Satan talking to you. He's saying, look at how wonderful life is. You've got a good marriage. All is good. God is good to you. And he's setting you up. And we don't appreciate it. Your health is fine. Isn't God good? Your bills are paid and there's some money in the bank. Isn't God good? Train your eye on these earthly blessings. And gauge God's goodness by what you see. Because life will not always be an accumulation of good things. Then when the hardships come, you will look out and have no evidence of God's goodness. So that's kind of the strategy behind what Satan is saying. Attach God's goodness to the fact that you've got uh, good circumstances, happy marriage, uh, good bank account, uh, your health is good, all these kinds of things. God 
therefore is good to you. But take these things away from you, and then what's your thought about God? Well, now you're ready to change your tune and say God is not good. So this is what Satan tried, albeit unsuccessfully, with Job. Job had all the best things all the best things in life, and Satan assumed that once they were gone, Job would turn his back on God. But Job trusted in God throughout, causing Satan to flee. So that is the uh, approach that Satan has. That's his, his play, to set you up, then when things go bad, to knock you down and try to take you out. Um, so that's the, the uh, attack that Satan has made. Now, next we get into a counterattack. And I think we'll leave that for next time if that's okay. Um, and open it up for some discussion or conversation about what we've considered so far. Yeah, I think one, one of the biggest lies that Satan throws at us is the lie of um, comparison, comparing ourselves to others. And uh, so we think that, you know, I'm just, doesn't seem like I'm being spir spiritual enough or, or um, <clears throat> even emotional enough in, in expressing uh, my love for the Lord is not as, not as expressive as someone else. And, and uh, I've been through that. And, and I think it, it, I like that what he said, what uh, uh, Ed Welch said about, um, it reveals our our understanding of the character character of God, and it really takes effort to change that focus to say it's not what about I feel, it's not about what I do. It's about that the truth of the matter is that it's Christ's work. It's His uh, perfect righteousness, His imputed righteousness, and active obedience. Uh, it's He is being. He has the right emotion and the right feelings and the right comparisons in my place. And, and when God looks on me and, and how I'm feeling at the moment, it's a matter of he's looking at Christ's perfect love for the Father in my place. And, and that takes effort to, to focus on that because we're so prone to look at ourselves and say, boy, look at me compared to this guy. <laughs> you know, this guy's really spiritual, and um, he's got a, he's got his theology down, and or whatever the case may be. So, um, it, it, there's a lot of truth to the fact that it's it's Christ's work in our behalf, and uh, it's it's not what we're doing. So. Perfect one Saturday place, morning. <laughs> yeah, I think one mm -hmm. place where yeah. it's unexpected that we have spiritual warfare and conflict is actually within the church and within worship services. Um, I think that's a place of spiritual conflict because uh, as a pastor, I'm countering false ideas that perhaps members in the congregation or in the broader community might have and replacing them with what God has to say about different things. So there's that kind of conflict there. And then there's just, you know, how are people receiving what's being said? Do they believe what's, what God's word says or do they reject it for themselves? Do they just explain it away? Um, to say, well, that's just the pastor's opinion or something like that. And, and, or the other hand is, maybe it's the pastor giving his opinion and people are accepting that as true without evaluating it as to whether it's actually from God's Word. You know, so oh, man. there's a, a, a real spiritual warfare taking place in worship, and we have to be aware of that. It's not like we're in this uh, reserve, this retreat area where... Uh, only good things are going to happen. There, there are many challenges that take place within worship. And that's why we need to pray, watch and pray, as Jesus told his disciples. Pray and uh, be spiritually alert. But like Chuck was saying, you know, being, being in the Word, I mean, we can come into the worship service with our own prejudices. I mean, let's, let's say uh, if I were a Democrat, ah, and, you know, and, and I come into church, and I hear you talking about politicians lying, well, I say, well, gee, he's talking about Trump, you know, <laughs> because I brought, I brought my, my biases with me. But it's the pastor's job, I assume, of course, to, to guide us in the word, what the, that you're not talking about 
trope or Biden, you're talking about the nature of lying and how it's an offense against God. And so, so that that's a battle right there, just going past people's prejudices. Yeah. And sticking to sticking to the word, and you have to be in the word, like Chuck, Chuck was saying. Yeah. And, and you know, like with the, with this with the regular services too, like we're, we covered a part where it said, you know, did God really say? Well, when you go into your sermon, not only are you saying what God said, you're elaborating on it, and I, I find it. I, I always feel like I'm on the same page when you're when you're when you're uh, giving your sermon, and 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 that is a and there's so many things that I have to think about. And even Tamara and I will discuss them for some time after the service because you bring out so much in it and then you, you relate it to things happening today. And it just gives so much to think about. And it kind of clarifies, this is what God said. You know, and, and, that, and, and that just becomes another, another little spot of light where it matters, you know. And uh, those things help when Satan attacks in those little simple, simple ways. Like, oh, like the commands. Oh, you know, not 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 to cover my my neighbor's property over there with my deer stand should be. Yeah, yeah, deer on his property. <laughs> Those kind of things, they're little subtle things that pop up all the time, you know. But but to 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 to, to respond accurately to these things, we need to certainly have a you know the, the message brought to us and, and have it have clarity there. It's very 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 good stuff. It, it, it's it's what we need as Christians, mm. you know. Very grateful. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And there, there's so much more to consider in those texts. You know, from what I've preached, you still go back into that text and explore and find more that's there. I mean, there's just such an abundance and depth there. Uh, I, I was just struck the other day. I was looking at the text again and thinking, well, why didn't I see that earlier? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the different elements of the text, like here at the end of the Song of Moses in the 17th verse, there's this triad that occurs uh, where God uh, says he's going to plant them, the Israelites, in his own mountain, a place you've made for your own abode, uh, the sanctuary which your hands have established. And so like three times God says basically the same thing. I'm going to take you back to Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem, and there you're going to meet with me. But he says it three times. Well, why? Well, I think it's reflective of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit are involved in our redemption and in fellowship with us. And their ownership with us in us is evident in those kinds of things. And uh, there was elsewhere as well in the text. Um, I, I, I'll have to look at it again to, to pick it out. But just little things like that you pick up and say, wow, isn't God amazing the way that he arranges things? And how he very subtly uh, points to himself and his glory and his personhood and so forth. So, yeah. One more yeah. illustration of that from the Song of Moses in Exodus 15. If you listen to the sermon, you remember I, I said that verse 11 was kind of the center of this song and everything revolves around it before it's the destruction of the, uh, the, Ar the army of Pharaoh. And after verse 11, you have the, the, the fear that comes on the other nations as they hear of what God has done for his people, and they will journey towards the, the new land. In verse 11, you have this triad again, uh, where it begins by asking, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? And that picks up what we have, the very introduction. Um, uh, this is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. And then there's this triad. Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders. Here's this threefold description of God's work. It's one work, but it's described in three ways. Majestic and holiness, awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders. And it's like the Father, Son, and Spirit all involved in redeeming His people and delivering them from their enemies and bringing them to His fellowship and communion. So, to me, I, I just delight in seeing the handiwork of God, divine authorship, evidence of divine authorship, and all the rest of it.